Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Malcolm Bell. I'm the vice chair for the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine uh, here at Mayo Clinic uh, Rochester. And uh, this is another in our series of uh, interviews with the experts. Today, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Courtney Bennett, who's currently our medical director of our cardiac intensive care unit, uh, who is here to talk to us about uh, COVID-19 uh, and uh, cardiovascular disease. So uh, welcome, Courtney. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, the, the first question I'm going to ask you uh, is a fairly basic one, I think, and that relates to... Uh, is there a heightened risk of uh, COVID-19 infection in patients who have pre-existing cardiovascular disease and how might that uh, impact their uh, prognosis? Yes, so the data is very strong. We do know that patients that have known cardiovascular disease or even other risk factors for cardiovascular disease are at increased risk for getting infected or getting COVID-19 infection. And as well as prognostic wise, patients that have underlying cardiovascular disease are getting sicker and they are requiring more ICU level of care. And what I mean by risk factors are patients with hypertension, diabetes, um, those are the other, obesity is a very big associated risk factor for getting the infection also being more critically ill or more severe illness. So for the patient that uh, lands uh, in the ICU or the CICU uh, mm -hmm. with who's COVID-19 positive, what would be the manifestations that you'd be looking for that would identify a patient as having uh, a myocardial insult or injury? Uh, so what are the things that you're looking for there that would tell you that there, there's something cardiac that needs to be addressed? So the patients that we've had in our cardiac ICU have primarily had um, signs of shock um, or, or less primary respiratory failure. So patients with primary respiratory failure and COVID have been managed here in our practice, mainly in other ICUs, but our patients who've had myocardial injury, and what we mean by that is uh, an elevation in the troponin values arise and fall above that 99th percentile cutoff, those patients um, may have higher troponin elevations, um, may have signs of shock, as I alluded to earlier. Um, and so and we manage the shock as the same way we would manage shock as any other cause. Um, some patients also may have findings consistent with myocarditis. Um, we may see ST segment elevations on their ECG, and that can be a little bit um, more challenging um, to, to differentiate from the type of you know, ACS as we're used to seeing uh, compared to um, a patient who may have severe myocarditis or um, severe myocardial injury. Um, in those patients, we have to use some other, um, some other data such as imaging um, to decide you know, what would be the next management step for sure. them. So maybe before we get there, uh, you, mm -hmm. you talked about troponin and, and, and yes. uh, we like, you know, I think, you know, most institutions now uh, in the country, uh, you know, very comfortable with high sensitivity troponin. So maybe you could just give us an idea what what's the magnitude of these troponin rises? I mean, sure. these patients who, who may have you know, septic shock, for example, or you know, severe respiratory uh, distress, uh, it wouldn't be surprising that they see some, at least some mild elevations of troponin. Yes. What are the patients uh, that you're know, concerned you that there's really maybe true injury in terms of rise and fall in troponin and what that magnitude uh, may be? And obviously it could be extremely high in the thousands yeah. with someone with myocarditis, but right. what, what are the typical levels that you've been seeing? So that's a great point. And, and actually the level of troponin elevation can help help guide us on multiple levels. So for the cardiac ICU patients, we're seeing troponins in the magnitude of hundreds to thousands um, with significant uh, deltas that are, are leading us to um, see that there's evidence for severe uh, myocardial injury. To that point, there's also value of troponin in patients, as I alluded to earlier, with, with risk factors. So if you find a patient who has COVID-19 infection and you check a troponin and there's mild elevations, in the troponin, and that actually, that's actually a, a good time for you to consider screening those patients for actual cardiovascular disease. And then there's these patients that fall 
in the middle with some moderate troponin elevations who may have underlying heart failure. And, and now they're having troponin elevations in, in the you know, teens to you know, less than 100 range, uh, with a, even with a given delta, they may have underlying heart failure. And then that last category that I think you're really asking about are patients that have evidence of severe troponin elevations in the hundreds to thousands. And that's, that's really an evident, uh, a sign that there's significant myocardial injury occurring. It doesn't it doesn't tell you the specific cause yet, though. Um, there's a lot of contributing factors. So patients could have uh, severe myocardial injury in the setting of more of a type 2 and STEMI, just from severe um, respiratory illness. Um, or this could be actually a true type 1 in the setting of significant inflammation and plaque rupture. So we're seeing we're observing very high levels of troponin. It's associated with higher mortality, but it's still not specific to the, the underlying cause. Sure. And, and how do you incorporate the ECG there? I mean, uh, do all these patients have uh, ECG changes? Or, and specifically, I'm thinking about ST depression. We may talk about ST elevation here in a moment, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, how, do, how does that uh, uh, factor in here? Oh, the ECG, it varies widely. And so I can't say that there's a specific pattern for injury that we're observing or ischemia that, that we're observing or that I've seen in the literature um, that would help guide us there. Okay. And then the patients who have ST elevation, mm -hmm. uh, and some of these you might have actually presented you're with ST elevation, but you're right. uh, desperately ill uh, with uh, respiratory failure. Um, how do you handle these? I mean, these all go to the cath lab or are you more circumspect? Uh, how, what, what's your approach? Yeah, we, we try and take um, a protocolized approach to these patients. So patients that have severe critical illness, severe respiratory failure with troponin elevations and no clear evidence of ischemia um, don't benefit actually from going to the cath lab and it actually could be harmful in these patients. And so those, those patients, that end of the spectrum should really be treated conservatively to treat the underlying um, critical illness. Um, patients who have- That's know, even if they have ST elevation. Um, so if they, if the patients, um, if they have ST elevation, that's the opportunity to really get in touch with your local team, your, your cardiac um, care team, whatever um, organization you have at, at your institution and, and really get consultation from those experts. You can incorporate echo imaging into those patients. And even depending on how ill they are, consider um, even CTA, CTA imaging to help guide you. It's tough because there's data out there to support that um, a fair number of patients with severe COVID who have ST elevations actually don't have any underlying ep epicardial coronary obstruction. Um, one study out of New York found that um, out of 28 patients presenting with severe COVID and ST elevation, about 40% of them had didn't have obstructive coronary disease. Um, and so it's really important to involve expert um, consultation and collaboration to differentiate who would benefit from intervention, from who it could actually be more harmful in. So, so uh, as you're faced with such a patient, uh, it's your typical protocol to, for an emergency transthoracic echo, maybe followed by CT and possibly cath lab, depending. I mean, yes. and obviously people are cognizant of possible delays in presentation to reperfusion if, if indeed it's a true STEMI. Yes. So that that's definitely the concern because, you know, time is muscle. And so we don't want to delay revascularization in patients that could clearly benefit. Uh, and that's why, again, doing, you know, um, emergent expert consultation, um, incorporating echo, even point of care echocardiogram could be helpful. Um, and, and again, in patients that are already severely critically ill requiring ICU level care because of respiratory illness, uh, we know that they, they, that there's actually increased risk and, and low likelihood of benefit. Um, so it's really using a team-based approach to decide which patients have more likely acute coronary syndrome with ischemia who would benefit from revascularization from those where it could be more harmful. Sure. And then in the patients that you might suspect it's a non-STEMI, I mean, you know, 
I mean, still could be a type one or, you know, type two uh, MI. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like you would probably have a, a high threshold uh, before taking them to, you know, to, to the cath lab. H how would, would you manage those patients? So those patients would receive the same, the same medical therapy. So they would get their heparin, um, anticoagulation, dual antiplatelet therapy, um, monitoring in an ICU, um, depending on the other, um, severe, the severity of illness. And then, um, we would, again, yes, we would have high threshold for sending them, um, for coronary intervention. Okay. Uh, I mean, you would add statins. I mean, there's, Correct. You, you just give the sort of the, the typical, guideline recommended medical treatment for these. Correct. Correct. Okay. So there would, there would be no, there would be no deviation from the current guideline um, directed therapy for patients with end STEMI, especially if we're concerned for type one. Um, and then, sure. and then you would use the same, uh, the same risk factors for, um, you know, earlier intervention versus delayed intervention. If the patient is having evidence of ongoing ischemia or ventricular arrhythmias, then then that would um, be a point where we might say that the 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 risk you know is less than the you know the the benefit outweighs the risk of taking sure. them for coronary angiography. And then the ultimate uh, or near ultimate uh, case might be the, the patient who's in clear you know, shock that uh, you know uh, could be look like septic shock or distributive or cardiogenic. Uh, uh, maybe just a few quick words on how you manage those and uh, what your threshold is for um, uh, considering ECMO. Yeah, so again, the, the patients uh, who are presenting um, with shock will receive you know, potentially invasive monitoring if that would help guide our therapy. Um, again, we would we would even taking a step back from that, get an echocardiogram to determine if they have severely reduced ventricular function. Um, use invasive monitoring with inotropic support, and actually um, a, a good point for COVID nineteen specific population actually would be to see if they were eligible for any um, therapies um, specific to COVID as well as any trial enrollment. Um, that would be something that's uh, a little that would be different from standard management of any patient presenting with cardiogenic shock. Okay, so so in the last uh, minute or so we have here, um, I wonder if you could just address the, the the real vexing question of anticoagulation in, in these patients. You mentioned heparin earlier for the yes. you know, possible ACS patient, but as as we know, you know we've learned a lot of um, you know new things about these patients, uh, recommendations have, have changed. And I just wonder if you could just bring us up to date with how we should manage anticoagulation, particularly in terms of prophylactic anticoagulation. Yeah, that's a great question because it comes up again and again. And currently there, for patients hospitalized with COVID-19 infection who don't have any other indication for anticoagulation, if they're hospitalized, you would start them on prophylactic dose um, anticoagulation, low molecular weight heparin or um, sub-Q heparin. Patients that are not hospitalized or outpatient, you, it is not recommended to use um, prophylactic anticoagulation in these patients. For patients that are hospitalized, if you have um, suspicion, clinical suspicion for venous thromboembolism, then you would do the appropriate workup. Um, here specifically, uh, we are using um, D-dimer in patients that are hospitalized with COVID-19 to help guide whether or not we would um, do additional um, testing for venous thromboembolism, specifically looking at lower extremity Doppler. Um, and so that is a slight nuance to the prophylactic anticoagulation, but otherwise hospitalized patients receive prophylactic, pro prophylactic dose anticoagulation. In the, in the standard doses. In the standard. In the non-COVID patient standard doses. Correct, correct. So yeah. no recommendation for increased intensity at this time. There's three ongoing trials actually um, that have been halted um, using uh, systemic or therapeutic um, dose anticoagulation in patients. And, and we're at this point in time, at the time of our meeting today, we're waiting for um, some further information about those studies. Okay.
Well, thank you. I mean, unfortunately, that's all the time we have uh, for this. I really uh, like to uh, thank you for sharing your expertise and, and experience with these uh, incredibly difficult uh, patients, your uh, patients that you're, we, we've never seen in, until the last uh, year. So uh, right. very much appreciate you sharing uh, your experiences with uh, everyone today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.